everybody, Jennifer Schaus here coming to you live from Washington, D.C. And thanks for joining us in our webinar today. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. This is the uh, beginning of the federal government fiscal new year. It's obviously October 1st, and we've got a great lineup today. It's a mix of both government and industry, and we're going to hear about best practices. And we've got it segmented uh, by topic. Uh, so we're going to uh, dig into some of our slides here. Uh, we don't uh, take questions throughout the webinar, but it is being recorded. We'll send out the recording uh, as well as the link to the slides later this afternoon once we're able to convert the recording into a uh, MP4 file. So before we get started, just want to tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we're based in downtown Washington, D.C. and provide a variety of services for uh, companies that are selling to the federal government. We don't deal with state and local or education, just uh, the federal market. And so our clients typically come to us for anything from market analysis reports, business development. If it makes sense for them, we'll help them get onto the GSA schedule and manage that contract. Um, and then also that post award kind of back office compliance is another piece of our service. Uh, we do have a newsletter that goes out every Monday, which is perhaps how you found out about the event today. Uh, and that reaches 23, over 23,000 uh, subscribers, most of which I'd say 90% are probably government contractors or are government contractors. We've got some service providers uh, and then some government um, personnel as well who are subscribers. Uh, we've been putting webinars on for several years. And so we now have a, a library of 400 and over 450 complimentary government contracting uh, webinars. And they cover topics uh, on anything from GSA schedules to business development, uh, and then a lot of the legal pieces such as uh, bid protest, um, uh, FOIA requests, a little bit of everything. So uh, you can check out all of our recordings there on the YouTube channel. Uh, what we did in, um, just to rewind for a moment, in 2020, we covered every part of the FAR, which is the Federal Acquisition Regulation, and those uh, were uh, run through sequentially. So we started with FAR Part 1 in the first part of January and then ended with FAR Part 52 in December. Uh, this year, 2021, which has flown by, uh, we're kind of mirroring that uh, process and we're covering the DFARs. Those are Wednesdays at 12 o'clock, complimentary, so we're more than halfway through that series. If you want to listen to any of the recordings, you can find them on our website as well as our YouTube channel. We've also got uh, the second Friday of every month, a new, well, it was new for this year, uh, which is the GovCon Live Q&A Cafe. It's the second Friday of every month. Uh, there is a small fee to attend, which is $35. If you use the discount code DFARS, you'll get a D, uh, 15% $15 discount. Uh, next Wednesday, we wanted to mention uh, we do have a special, it's complimentary uh, webinar in our COVID contracting series, and it's the vaccination guidelines for contractors and subcontractors, uh, which recently just came out. Uh, so you can uh, find that link uh, to register on our website under the uh, event section. Next year, we're covering, uh, in the same spirit as the FAR and the DFARs, the FAR supplements. Uh, it's a webinar series. We're going to have primarily government contracts attorneys who will go through basically the agency and the department nuances uh, that they have within their own department or agency regarding contracting and procurement. And then on that uh, corresponding Friday, we'll have uh, the Department and Agency Playbook series. We're doing that in conjunction with FedMine. Uh, Archie Zemihan and uh, their group. Um, so they're going to cover some of the, um, the opportunities. We're also uh, doing this in conjunction with the McLean Group, which is a merger and acquisition um, outfit. And we will have government representation on most of those webinars as well. Sponsorships are available. One more thing I wanted to note is uh, a new series we're going to launch is called the, uh, the GIP. It's the Government Industry Partners. Uh, and so basically it allows you to conduct a webinar with us. Um, we will help promote it, uh, help you curate it. We're gonna host it, we'll record it, um, and then we'll post your webinar on our uh, website, YouTube channel, 
So you can do this as a one, two, or three part series. And so this will be all about your business. Um, so it's like today you'll present in front of a live audience. And as I mentioned, you get the recording, the registration list. Uh, so if you're targeting government contractors, this is probably a good service for you. Um, and I wanna make sure that hopefully everybody can uh, see my screen. Um, and so again, that service, this Government Industry Partners webinar series is allowing you to conduct a webinar with us. Okay, um, just to let you know, uh, next Friday is this GovCon live Q&A cafe series that I mentioned. So every month is a different topic. Um, next Friday is covering set-asides. Uh, with the folks here you see on your screen, uh, most people that are in the government contracting sector are probably familiar with these names. Uh, and then in November, the second Friday is uh, November 12th, and we will cover pricing. And uh, Marsha, I believe, is joining us later today as we talk about best practices for uh, pricing. And then uh, we'll round out December with mergers and acquisitions uh, with these four panelists. You can sign up on our website um, for all of these. So just... Uh, Go to our website, go to the GovCon Live Q&A tab, and uh, you'll find uh, the links there to register. Thank you. Okay, next we're gonna dig into market research, and it looks like we've got uh, Archiza Meehan with us from FedMine. Um, so Archiza, thank you so much for joining us, and um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump over here to your five best practices. Perfect. Thank you, Jennifer, for <clears throat> inviting me to this amazing event to start the new fiscal year. I actually love the tips that Ms. Miles just gave. I think they were truly on point. Um, this is the fiscal new year, last fiscal year so far. We have about $528 billion that were awarded, um, not including the DOD contracts, which are subject to the 90-day delay. So it will be interesting to see if we close the last fiscal year at a higher amount than FY20 or lower. But as we start talking about market research, it is important to remember that the federal spending cycle is triggered by an agency need, which truly sets in motion the industry's predictable cycle of activity. Understanding the need of the agency is critical, and hence, I think, the need for market research. Um, use market research to interpret the data to build the knowledge to help you grow. It is the foundation of your success. To win the business and grow, you need to know what opportunities to go after as you build your pipeline. Market research specifically will help you understand the agency, the vendors, and the opportunity and make the decision whether you really need to go after you know, whether if it's actually an opportunity, it's not an opportunity for this fiscal year and make those decisions, uh, which are so important. Um, and when we talk about agency intelligence, it's really getting to know who your target agency is. Uh, you know, once you know, understanding your buying patterns, knowing your forecasts, your exhibit 300s and 53s, you know, if there are GVACs that, that you might need to get on. All of that is important and it comes in when you start understanding and doing your market research on your agency. The vendor intelligence includes understanding your competition, your teaming partner, which we see a lot more of, um, you know, or looking at existing 8As that you might want to look at tying up with, understanding their vehicles that they're using, GSA schedules, the pricing, expiration dates of their main contracts, understanding if a company has actually filed any protests and what's happened, uh, you know, are, are, they, are there any legal proceedings happening? So there's a lot of good information that you really want to focus on uh, and you want to put all of these elements together to create that actionable intelligence and that helps you be strategic as you grow your pipeline and grow to be a very successful business. Those are my little tips. <laughs> great, thank you so much. And sorry, I think I accidentally advanced to the, your uh, question here. Uh, great points. And uh, what would you say are the data sources utilized most to perform market research for the federal marketplace? So, um, you know, in addition to uh, providers such as ours that integrate all the data, I would say there are a lot of 
And your website actually has amazing resources for all the places and data sources that we could look for market research. But uh, SAM.gov uh, has all the opportunities and now the award data since it's the front end for FPDS. FPDS, of course, USA Spending also has some really good information, especially on the subcontract data. Um, agency websites have some you know, good information on their forecast. Some agencies are better than others. Um, learning the agency budgets, it's super interesting because you see so much in those agency budget documents. And then, of course, our company websites and the LinkedIn profiles give you a lot of insight into what a company is doing. So I would say these are all data sources that we can use to create the foundation of a market research. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, nice to um, have you on the program today. And um, yeah, uh, we appreciate you. your time and your help. Thanks, Archiza. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Next up, we've got uh, our longtime friend and colleague, Eileen Kent, with uh, the Federal Sales Sherpa. You've got her contact information here. And Eileen, hopefully you're, uh, you're live with us. Hello, everybody. Jennifer, thank you so much for inviting me today. It's so great to be on with everybody and already great value so far from um, the, the speakers before. So the couple of best practices that I wanted to talk to you about today for market research, we heard some good things, which was know, your, know who your three to five agencies are. But how do we begin doing that? Well, when we look at the data and we want to go out there and search the data on who buys what we sell, we need to sit down as a team. So you want to sit down with your team and identify some critical keywords for what you do, because you're going to use those keywords to go to these data sites to search the intelligence of who buys what you sell. So I'm gonna give you a couple of quick examples. In furniture, for example, you might wanna write down the word furniture, but they might have inside the data, inside the description of requirement, chair, desk, workstation. But then if you think workstation, you go, wait a minute, that could be an IT workstation. So we need to kind of double check that data when we look at it. Um, credenza, training room, surgical furniture, bed, mattress. So whatever type of furniture that we're selling, we want to kind of dig deeper in the keywords that we're actually going to use to do the data search. Now in services for IT, for example, I do a lot of data dips for this and people give me the keywords program or project manager. And I got to tell you that those are such general words. I might as well type in, you know, um, painting because every single building needs painting, right? Um, so when we do project or program management, it's too general. If we're doing database and um, IT related things, we need to have deeper things. Like if we said cloud, we've got to siphon out words like cloud that's part of clouds, like in the sky in NASA. So we want to maybe put in Java programmer or Spelunk as a software. And if we decide to look for hardware, we want to say server, monitor, keyboard, blade, hard drive, cable. We want to be specific on these keywords. I don't like to do data dips for NAICS codes because there's so many NAICS codes for what you do and a lot of NAICS codes that start with the word other. So I use keywords to do data and intelligence and I also want to do a peek at who your competitors are are getting business from and in the data these days it was just recently changed it's not vendor name anymore it's legal business name when you're looking for this information the other thing i want you to think about when you do a round table with your team on uh keywords is to think about the step before they buy what you sell so for example, back to the furniture example, maybe you do a data dip in contract opportunities for GSA leasing space or moving or construction projects or build and alterations, because if they're going to do that, they might need furniture, right? So think of the step before they need you for your data dips as well. And as you've already heard, you know, you want to do a data analysis and then see who bubbles up top.
See who buys the most of what you sell and focus on them. And as you've already heard, Sam.gov is a great site there. They have an ad hoc report. USA Spending, you can pull data. You can also pull subcontracting data for your competitors if you wanted to look at that. And of course, you can always buy a subscription service like FedMine and others that are going to be talking to you today. Um, but what I do and what I always emphasize is it's great to have this information, but you've got to build a focused action plan around those three to five departments, the agencies, the location, and the people within those agencies, and you actually have to execute it. You've got to pick up the phone and use the data that you've uncovered to have intelligent conversations with your clients. They spend a lot of time putting that data up there. So if you go in saying, who are you working with? They're going to look at you like, really? You're going to ask me that? It's the usual suspects. Go do your homework. So do your homework first. And then when you're asking questions, you're going to ask deeper, um, more detailed information from their procurement forecast, from SAM.gov, from the contracting opportunities, and be able to speak to them in, in terms of what's happening at their agency. Better intelligence makes you a better salesperson, getting a deeper understanding of what the story is on the ground. Awesome. Thank you, uh, Eileen. And how good is the data out there? I got to tell you, it's like a dream come true for salespeople who know what they're looking for. You can uncover who buys what you sell, from whom, how they bought it, what type of set aside it was, how many bids they received, when the contract comes to an end. It goes on and on and on. There's almost 300 data elements per contract. Now, when I look at this data, I, I bring it down to about 50 because those are things you can act upon that make sense when you're in the field. The data is outstanding. So go and dive in there and give it a try and best of luck to everybody. And I hope you have a great day today. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Emily. It was great to have you on the program. Appreciate the insight. Thank, thank you. Great. Next up, we've got Jack Siney down in the uh, sunny Florida area from GovSpend. Uh, Jack, it's great to have you on our program. And uh, I'm going to just bounce over here to your uh, top five best practices. Hi, Jennifer. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, great job, Artisha, Eileen. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the time, Jennifer. Thanks for the opportunity. Hey, I, I just want to piggyback on what Eileen said, because um, I think the folks, you'll have a variety of data sources today from the sponsors and, and the folks that Jennifer works with. So I I wanted to focus a little bit more on the execution part of, hey, how do I actually take my research and, and, and get to a deal or win a deal or where should I do market research? And so quickly for me, number one, we always talk about having a flagship agency. That's somebody that loves you, appreciates what you do, and they will say and carry the torch for you inside the government. And so a lot of times as well-intended, super smart uh, sales folks or, or owners, we can say great things about ourselves, but when an agency loves you, you over-service them, they will tell other agencies. And so I just want to encourage folks, instead of trying to maybe get deals in a couple spots or looking for a, a variety of agencies, find one that will love you, loves what you do, will say great things about you. And then my next one, which could seem kind of odd to some folks, I know in the federal government, they talk a lot about like capability statements, but as Candace mentioned in her intro, a lot of times it's about relationships and the government not necessarily is not very excited sometimes to be the first user of a product or service and so just encourage you to go get some third-party validation go get some press coverage some outside sources that'll say good things about you and your company um, it may sound like a weird thing but when you send somebody hey we were on the cover of the paper we were had this big article in some magazine it really helps validate you as a company and agencies are more uh, more likely to use your service or your product because again, somebody else has already seen it and, and uses it and works on it. Uh, my third one would be, you know, don't spend a lot of time and energy working on an RFP unless two things. Really, one, if, if you've helped scope the RFP, obviously we all know that, that would be wonderful. And then secondly, you know, trying to have a creative angle or unique offer to the agency because uh, for most things, the government's purchased it numerous times or has a sense for who they'd like to use. And so can you do something creative to make them move toward you as a vendor it can be super powerful. It could be a service offering. It could be a 24 seven return policy or a support offering. It could be things that are service-based, but find something that's really unique to you and your company. 
which would be great. Uh, number four, again, as, as Candace kind of kicked off today's webinar with, highly encourage folks to find a socioeconomic classification that works for you. Because one of the things folks may not know is that once you do for one federal agency, other federal agencies will typically find you as well. So getting in the door as one of the classifications that are out there, a woman-owned business or a veteran-owned business or service disabled or 8A, you name it, um, that when other agencies are trying to meet their requirements, they're going to contact some other agencies and say, hey, do you have a vendor that does this? Do you have somebody that did a good job for you in this area? So that ability to, to, to qualify and get certified for one of those classifications can open a lot of doors in opposite, instead of you having to always go find opportunities, sometimes they'll come find you because they have a, a purchase they have to do in a, in a kind of set aside way. And uh, they'll actually go and find you as a company, which is a great call. We all love to receive those calls inbound, uh, you know, sale, which is amazing. And then lastly, um, you know, I just don't want to uh, have, have us forget about what's happening in COVID. We've kind of all semi adjusted to this new work environment. I want to encourage folks, when you're doing your market research and looking for things and trying to tell your story, um, just acknowledge that a lot of folks are still not in the office necessarily full time. They're all doing somewhat creative things to get their job done. And you trying to modify your normal sales process to accommodate that by putting things in video format, uh, getting them uh, data elements. We know we can't really go meet with folks much anymore. And so trying to do creative things so that they hear your sales pitch, get to know you, get to know about your company, encourage you to spend some time thinking about that because it can be a huge make or break item uh, now that kind of the normal sales process maybe that worked for the last decade or so uh, not, not necessarily are so relevant today in this COVID era as we continue to adjust. So those would be my five kind of operational execution things I'd recommend for folks. Great, I love it. And uh, always good to have, uh, have you with us, Jack. Uh, what would you say is the best way to get press coverage for my company or solution? <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. So I just really, really quickly, I know there's a lot of guests coming. I would just say this, the media, imagine if you work for a, a news outlet or, or, you know, even as us, as we try to put out content every day, it's hard to come up with new ideas and new stuff. So if you approach any of the news outlets with, with a story that's about the citizenship, about their constituents, they're super likely to pick up your story. So don't call and say, oh, I want you to do a puff piece of my company. But if you say, hey, this is how we help the our community. This is how we help the constituents that are actually read your newspaper, read your publication. They're very, very, very likely to pick up the story because every day or every week, they have to find content pieces that are relevant. And so if you serve it up to them on a platter in a very neutral way, uh, I would say seven out of 10 times, they're, they're likely to take you up on the offer to do a story because again, they're always trying to have, they always have a need for new ideas and uh, they love when kind of one or two are handed to them. So that would be my biggest suggestion, all right? Great. Thanks so much, Jack. Uh, have a great uh, rest of the day and great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, thank you so much. God bless. Thanks. Okay. Next up, we've got uh, Nicole Tripodi from Fed Inform. Nicole, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just dig into your top five best practices. And you might be on mute. Let me double check here. Uh, Nicole, hopefully you can hear us. Um, can you hear me okay this way? There we go. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Well, today everybody has broad access to federal contracting data and information. The business development advantage has moved from access to information as an advantage to the ability to curate actionable information as an advantage. So here are five skills that will move you closer to making sense of all the data. Skill one, write research questions before beginning market research. Truly effective market research helps us solve business problems. So first, identify those problems and craft them into research questions. So let's say we have a business development approach that's mostly reactive to bluebirds, those unexpected, unplanned, and unprepared for competed opportunities. Here's an example of how I would turn this into a research question that will help us get ahead of the opportunity before it drops. What contracts are expiring in fiscal year 2022 that are likely to be set aside for small business, have a total contract value between five and 10 million, and were awarded by the Department of Education? Now, my only job is to find the information that answers that question. Skill two, avoid research rabbit holes. A research rabbit hole is when we become distracted by chasing information that's interesting and not relevant. 
This is about staying focused. Each time we receive access to a new database or receive a new offer for a market research report, we ask ourselves whether this information is information that should be curated in order to answer our research questions. So over time, we develop the ability to make very efficient decisions, but as we're getting started, we can write down our research questions and track our steps. Skill three, learn advanced research techniques. Examples of an advanced research technique could be building a custom report from free source databases like the Federal Procurement Data System or Boolean searching. And why this is important is because research reports and databases are designed for consumption by a large audience. Our advanced research techniques parse information so that it's specific and it's relevant to us. Maybe a market research database can pull down a list of likely competitors for an opportunity, but our advanced research techniques can further identify specific contracts our competitors are likely to use for past performance when competing an, on an opportunity. Skill four is overcoming unfamiliar report findings or unknown language. So we often find ourselves in a situation where the data just doesn't make sense. There's an easy trick that helps us draw better conclusions from our market research. And it is this, because most of the databases that curate federal contracting data rely heavily on the Federal Procurement Data System or FPDS, we can check out the FPDS data dictionary whenever we get stuck. It's a great resource available right on the Federal Procurement Data System. And here we can learn about federal data, its meaning and how to interpret it. And then skill five, leverage traditional and non-traditional sources of information. So if you've been in GovCon for a hot minute, you've already heard about market research tools like USA Spending and the Federal Procurement Data System, FPDS, but there's other resources too, sites like it-board.gov and calc.gsa.gov for pricing data. There are published documents like agency strategic plans and Office of Inspector General reports. The bottom line is to get creative about how we can use all the tools that are at our disposal to curate the information needed to answer our research questions. Awesome. Thank you, Nicole. And now we're going to pop over to your, uh, your questions. Now, what is the role of a business development analyst? A business development analyst is an individual in a business development support role that knows the resources that we discussed today and also has the research skills that I just went over. So this is an individual that has the skills to curate and make sense of market research information. So a very good business development analyst can source opportunities, um, support most capture management efforts, and even supply proposal teams with information as direct inputs to the proposal. Things like information about the customer or about the environment or about our competition. Um, business development analysts in the DC area typically have salaries that range from 70 to 100K and sometimes more for really advanced skills and capabilities. So a question that I often receive as a follow-on to this one comes from small businesses who wonder how they can compete against firms who have somebody with these skills and talents on their bench. And I think that building a strong internal market research capability is accessible to companies of all sizes. And a lot of times it comes down to a business decision, whether we're gonna do it ourselves, assign it to an existing employee, hire a new employee, or hire a third party. Great, thank you so much. If you guys wanna reach Nicole, her contact information is here on the screen. And that wraps up the, uh, the first section, which was market research. And again, a special thanks to all of our sponsors who make uh, the event possible. Thanks again, everybody, and thanks to our sponsors.